Thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm Jamie Gass, Director of Pioneer Education. I hope you and your families are safe and healthy. Welcome to our webinar releasing our new book, Hands-On Achievement, Massachusetts' National Model Vocational Technical Schools. Before we begin, the powers that be asked me to mention the audio will be muted. The audience will be muted for the, uh, for the webinar. In their introduction to our book, the co-authors of the Bay State's Education Reform Law, Tom Birmingham and Governor Bill Weld wrote, perhaps the most transformative element of the state's landmark 1993 Education Reform Act was a requirement that voc tech students be held to the same academic standards as their counterparts in comprehensive public high schools, including that they pass the same MCAS tests to achieve their diplomas. For nearly 30 years, the Commonwealth's state-led K-12 education reform work has been a historic success, leading us to be number one in the country in reading and math since 2005, while also being the only state that's internationally competitive in math and science. In addition, the group of pre-existing schools that have made the most academic progress are our nation-leading vocational technical schools. They have done this while simultaneously preparing their students for careers as carpenters, plumbers, auto repair workers, medical technicians, in agriculture, and even the life sciences. Unmistakably, this is a great story of educational achievement. Not that long ago, the Voc Tech schools, whose primary focus is occupational education and serve nearly twice the state average of special needs students, were among the state's lowest academic performers. By embracing the accountability provisions of education reform, including academic quality, school choice, school-based autonomy, and working with businesses to prepare their students for the workplace, these Voc Tech schools have delivered for their kids, the kids they serve, and taken their workforce development performance to an entirely new level compared to other states. That is, by using the tools of education reform, the Massachusetts Voc Tech students now score on par with or higher than academically their peers in comprehensive high schools. They produce students who are prepared for careers in trades and industry while achieving high graduation rates microscopic dropout rates, and having more than 5,000 students on wait lists. How did this all happen? Well, I'll let our book co-editors and distinguished speakers provide some more of the details, but I'd like to quickly offer four big picture thoughts to help frame this topic. Number one, state leadership and school accountability matter. That bipartisan compromises forged by Tom Birmingham, Mark Roosevelt, and Bill Weld with the 1993's laws grand bargain of additional state money for accountability compelled Massachusetts K-12 education to focus on academic quality, objective testing, and accountability for everyone in the system. And it worked. These 1990s state leaders, board of education members, and commissioners, along with school-based leaders and teachers, marked a golden age of political will in K-12 education that's a beacon to the country. Number two, School choice matters. The fact that Voc Tech schools are high schools of choice, where the students also choose their occupational track have a gr and have great results is not a coincidence. Choice in education as in life counts. And we know that when students can select their own educational paths, as is the longstanding practice across higher education in America, they tend to be more invested in succeeding both academically and in their careers. The Voc Tech schools long wait lists speak for themselves, but also demonstrate that school choice coupled with the Voc Tech's student centric cultures deliver stellar results for kids. Number three, occupational education grounded in quality academic content matters. The MCAS test was controversial, but what got less attention was the academic content taught and tested in Massachusetts. MCAS standards with their firm grounding in the liberal arts, reading and math is the secret sauce. Training chefs, carpenters, plumbers, electricians, and medical technicians in the 21st century, not to mention preparing young people to own and run their businesses, requires the strong ability to read, write, command numbers, and communicate verbally. Our Voc Tech schools, with their unique schedules alternating between academic subjects and occupational education, have, has made all the difference. Finally, number four, Partnerships with businesses matter. Massachusetts, which doesn't have many natural resources, 
thrives by its wits and industry. For decades, the Voketech schools have built clo close relationships with businesses, trades, and employers of all kinds for advice, apprenticeships, and career placement. These Voketech schools serve a very practical purpose of supplying our state with the human capital and workforce it needs to compete in the 21st century global economy. In sum, for nearly 20 years, Pioneer has authored research papers on the successes of the Vogue Tech Schools. We produced this book to remind policymakers why our state is number one in Vogue Tech education, but also to serve as a laboratory of democracy to share our best practices with other states. I'd like to thank Allison Frazier and Bill Donovan, whose Pioneer papers comprise many of the chapters of the book. I remain grateful to Fred Savoy, a longtime friend of and leader in the Vogue Tech community who wrote our concluding chapter and is also working on his own larger history of Vogue Techs in Massachusetts. With us this afternoon, we have David Ferreira and Chris Sinicola, co-editors of Hands-On Achievement, Massachusetts National Model Vocational Technical Schools. I have to say these two guys did a wonderful job of abridging, compiling, and researching uh, and writing the book. Karen Ward, Executive Director of Skills USA, Massachusetts. Barry Bluestone, Professor Emeritus of Political Economy at Northeastern University. And Tim Murray, President and CEO of the Worcester Regional Chamber of Commerce. We're pleased to begin with David Ferreira. Hi, Jamie, and thank you very much for this opportunity to participate in all the work of the Pioneer Institute. I've spent pretty much my entire professional career in vocational technical education. And I guess that means two things. I have a lot of experience in voc tech ed and the Massachusetts system, and I've seen its growth and transition over, the, over these many years. The second thing I know is when my birthday rolls around in October, I will not be celebrating my 49th birthday. But during my career in Massachusetts vocational technical education, I have witnessed the growth of a system which began over a hundred years ago in the Commonwealth with a primary mission of providing an alternative form of education. Many people described it as schools that were for other people's children, for children who learned with their hands, and for children that were not college material. What has developed is a whole new pedagogy. As Jamie just described it, a student-centric culture, a whole new experiential type of hands-on learning that blends both technical competency and academic proficiency. A dual career path where its graduates can choose to further their education at a post-secondary level or go directly into the workforce as a, in an apprenticeship program. The result is that we have become, as Jamie said, schools of choice where you can choose to do two things in one school. You were able to attend a high school where you become college ready or and be prepared to enter the workforce directly with saleable skills. Massachusetts vocational technical education had a serious challenge with the Education Reform Act of 1993. From schools that originally spent half a year in shop, a quarter of the year teaching related theory, related math and blueprint reading, and a quarter of the year in academic classrooms. Hence, schedules were changed to half vocational and half academics for blocks of either one or two weeks and alternating back and forth. State frameworks were developed 
for each of the 45 program offerings. These VOCTEC frameworks included standards for high school diplomas. The standards were taught in an applied context that parallel the vocational skill competencies for that particular trade or career pathway. We called it applied integrated instruction. I had personally learned early in my career as a first year science teacher at Diamond Regional Vocational down in Fall River, Mass, that teaching theoretical or classical physics was nearly impossible. It needed to be applied physics where Pascal's laws, as well as Bernoulli's principles, made sense to automotive students. And in mathematics, the Pythagorean theorem was relevant to carpentry students when determining angle cuts for roof rafters in a post and beam construction. And the results of all of this have been incredible. Naturally, it was not without resistance in the early years of changing pedagogy. But over time, the data became crystal clear. Regional vocational schools achieved the lowest dropout rates in the Commonwealth at 0.6%, compared to a statewide average of 1.8% three times lower, with some schools having no dropout rates at all. And the vocational, technical, and agricultural schools have the highest rate of graduation in the Commonwealth. Just this morning, I was reading an article in the Sun Chronicle, a fairly large newspaper in the southeastern part of Massachusetts. And it was based on research done by Chuck Beat Magazine, where that organization studied 26 states across the nation. And in 20 of the 26 states, graduation rates in 2021 had dropped, much of it caused by COVID and uh, a large amount of virtual learning. Yet in the communities that the newspaper readership subscribes to only six had increased graduation rates, including Tri-County Regional Vocational Technical with a remarkable 98.2% rate of graduation. And this is being accomplished while having a much higher level and percentage of special needs students. On average, most of the regional voc techs approach nearly 30% of their population as special needs compared to 17% statewide. We no longer have schools that have academic teachers on one side of the house and vocational teachers on the other. We are all vocational, technical, and agricultural mission uh, teachers. We all have the same mission. We are also an integral part of the workforce development system and a close business partner with business and industry. Our statutory requirements for each of our 45 vocational technical programs ensures a direct link with employers of our graduates. These individual advisory committees in each of our schools made up of parents, students, representatives of business and industry, post-secondary re representation, representation from apprenticeship programs, as well as regional employment boards meet a minimum of twice a year in open session. And they make recommendations on curriculum changes as each of the industries change with advancement. Needed upgrading of equipment to remain state of the art is recommended. Forecasts on upcoming changes 
in employee competencies that meet regional needs. And most importantly, cooperative education opportunities where students halfway through their junior year or their entire senior year who have met the technical competency standards and standard in their academic uh, ability are allowed to accept paid employment at least 30 hours a week in lieu of additional training in a shop or laboratory. We also have developed statewide agreements with the community colleges that advance standing towards an associate's degree in the student's career path as well as articulation agreements with various apprenticeship programs across the Commonwealth. We have small learning communities, which was a uh, something that was very important just a short time ago. And uh, these small learning com communities are available as a result of the low pupil teacher ratio in the vocational programs and half of their career in high school, two out of the four years are spent with the same three or four instructors who get to know them as family, who can identify changes in a student's health, their social uh, appropriateness, and to determine if family issues are interfering and refer them for their proper assistance. So I'm pleased to be part of this today, and it is my pleasure at this time to introduce my co-editor, Chris Sinicola. Well, thank you, David, for that kind introduction and an excellent overview of vocational education in Massachusetts. Um, I'd like to thank Jamie and my um, fellow panelists, as well as the authors of the uh, white papers that were that formed the core of the book. Um, for their uh, expertise and this opportunity to speak with everyone. Um, David's experience is, is uh, very long and, and his explanation was excellent. My uh, involvement with uh, vocational education is from a very different perspective, that of a, a longtime journalist, uh, 30 years in journalism, and having had the opportunity to go to many uh, schools to talk to students and to see programs in action from time to time. And uh, my own kids, two of them went to vocational school for um, to some degree and went to a variety of schools. So over the years, I get to see all kinds of educational uh, models in play, uh, public, private, uh, parochial, vocational. And I have to say that the vocational model is really outstanding. Um, I put it right near the top, if not at the top, and one of the reasons for that, that David alluded to, is this very unique model that Massachusetts has had of 50% of time spent in shop and 50% of uh, students' time spent in an academic setting. And that really, although it's changed as he described over the years, the, those percentages have, have morphed a little bit. When you go back to the beginning of, of vocational education, the industrial schools, the so-called first generation of schools in Massachusetts, it was very clear from the beginning that time on task mattered greatly. Uh, what had changed, and uh, this continues to this day, is the emphasis given to academics. Originally, very little. And I think that was probably the origin of some very unfortunate stereotypes that I think many of us remember from years past where students who went to vocational technical schools were considered somehow less capable, less, achieve, uh, less academically advanced, um, had achieved less. And we're you know, called names and motorheads and all the rest of this. Um, the fact is nothing could be further from the truth. That has changed years ago. And <clears throat> the uh, vocational students today are really at the top of their game. They, these are schools of choice. Um, I think back to um, some of the first plumbers we had when we bought our home. And uh, the first gentleman we had here was a graduate, I believe, of, of Worcester Boys Trade, now Worcester Technical High School from many years ago, very competent, accomplished, experienced gentleman came in, did gas fitting, uh, heating, you name it. But whenever he did it, it was old school. He was rough and ready. He knew what he was doing, but you always wondered, well, does he know the latest code? Does he know this? Does he know that? The job always got done. The house never blew up. 
And then uh, recently we, we hired a, another plumber, um, a young man who came in, went into our basement, looked around and began to tick off everything about it that was within the code, that was grandfathered, that needed to be addressed, that should be addressed and how to do it. It was an extraordinary performance. And I said to him, where did you go to trade school? And he said, Blackstone Valley Tech. I just knew from the competence and the, the confidence that, that he exhibited that he had had a trade school education. And um, it was really very interesting to see that contrast. Um, the academic role has changed, but what really struck me in doing the research um, on this book was how the schools held fast to that model, that insistence of time on task. In the 1950s and 60s, as the regional schools were developed and more emphasis was paid to academics necessarily, uh, concerns about Sputnik and losing the space race to the Soviets and keeping up technologically, the development of computers and the information age, all of this pushed these schools from a strict emphasis on manual arts to a real combination, a blending of manual skills and information skills. And it's been um, very interesting to see over the years, the changes that take place district by district, uh, where districts are free and to add new programs, to drop programs that are no longer popular or relevant. And some of that, of course, speaks to the real need for skilled labor. Um, the other you know, uh, theme throughout history has been that these schools were designed specifically to provide workers for industries. Um, Worcester is an excellent example of that uh, as a driving force behind the original legislation. Uh, Worcester produced workers necessary for the wire industry and all kinds of abrasives and other uh, applications in those days and continues to do so today for more modern industries, which is the case, of course, across the, um, across the state. Uh, what's remarkable when you look at that 50-50 model, however, and you ask yourself, how is it possible that students in voc tech education who are spending 50% of the time that their peers in comprehensive high schools are spending on academics are somehow outperforming them? So it, it needed more investigation. And when we looked into that, what we have found is that it's the relationships that are forged in the classrooms that, that David spoke about, the mentorship, the sense of family, really knowing the kids that makes the difference. These students who choose a voc tech education are motivated. They want to come to school every day. They want to learn. They really enjoy those relationships and they get to spend extended periods of time, a week at a time, really focused on that. It's not that they're going for an hour or two a day or alternating days. They're really focused on the task. And so because it's also blending the academic skills with the vocational skills, the results speak for themselves. Extremely low dropout rates, extremely high graduation rates. And 50 to 75% of these students are going on to some form of post-secondary education. Another point that I, I wanna focus on that, that we get into in the book is the role of urban communities and the so-called gateway cities in Massachusetts, um, Boston, Worcester, Springfield, Fall River, uh, New Bedford, uh, Lawrence, Lynn, uh, places where you face, um, you've always had large groups of immigrants. Um, there are lots of English as a second language students and families, um, poverty, some lack of opportunity relative to other places in the state. And the question is, how do voc techs succeed with these students? Well, the answer is they succeed very well with these students, precisely because they're schools of choice and they're offering these students opportunities that they may not have in their comprehensive schools. And um, they're showing that the myths about, you know, these kids can't learn, or this group can't learn, or, well, they're poor, so how can you expect them to learn? Well, put them in the right environment, give them the resources and give them the mentorship and the guidance they need and they can learn as well or better than any other student in the state or in the country. Um, that's been borne out by the statistics and that the same holds true, of course, for the special needs kids. Um, so Massachusetts is leading the way in many areas and showing that this can be a model across the country. Um, so I think the, the real key to understanding the success of vocational education is to understand that they have held fast to the principles that have proven themselves over time. The 50-50 model, uh, resisting educational fads, which 
come and go in education, of, of course, we all know that. Um, and also the uh, role of the business community, as, as David mentioned, um, each school has advisory committees um, and these consist of experts in the field who know what the latest requirements are. They understand what business needs. They know what trends are taking place and where they need to move the um, curriculum and how they need to adjust it. And of course, this has led to a lot of uh, very wonderful partnerships, fruitful partnerships between the schools and the businesses, business community. Um, and I, I think too of uh, the model at the college level with uh, Northeastern particularly where one of my children attended <clears throat> and had a wonderful experience with the co-op programs. It's really that same model taken to the next level. So I think the um, Voctech education has shown the success of that model over time and over generations and shows that it can be taken from the middle school right up through the post-secondary um, level. So I'd like to um, introduce our next speaker, uh, Karen Ward, who is Executive Director of Skills USA Massachusetts to share some of her perspectives. Karen. All right, well, thank you, Chris, and um, thank you for the opportunity to join um, this amazing group of people. Um, as we talk about the great work of the Pioneer Institute um, in researching and recording the educational achievements and in innovation for the CTE system in Massachusetts. Um, I too have spent my entire professional career uh, in career and technical education in Massachusetts. I am also a product of career and technical education in Massachusetts. I'm a graduate of Northeast Metro Tech in Wakefield, Massachusetts, and have lived the career and technical education system in the state and uh, certainly um, agree with the way that the system works to benefit all students. Uh, when I looked at the research and looked through the book and uh, read the book, uh, it took on a persona of um, what I like to look at it as um, um, mirrors and magnifying glasses. Um, it certainly mirrors um, what, you know, it's the reflection of the policy and the procedures and the practices of career and technical education. It really, you know, reflects all of that work that has been done, but also puts a magnifying glass on what works. And when you put a magnifying glass on it, you also see the little flaws. Um, and, and those are our challenges for the future and uh, some of the things that I think we can address through continued policy. But my comments uh, focus on the point where educational policy and practice intersects with the student experience. Um, career and technical education has a very unique ability to educate the whole student, uh, to work with students on their technical skills, certainly, but also their workplace and their personal skills. Uh, the relationships that Chris spoke about that, that students have with their teachers are lifelong relationships, which um, is certainly speak to their development, their desire to learn, and their desire to achieve. Uh, over the last decade, the growth and change um, really truly has been the norm in career and technical education. Uh, you know, you talk about education fads that come and go, but in career and technical education, it's been more like a march. Um, a march with, um, you know, a, a goal in mind. Uh, that being, um, you know, there's significant interest from the business community, from the media, from government, at both the state and federal level, uh, CTE has been increasingly in the spotlight um, as thus the strategy for handling our workforce challenges and educating a future workforce, uh, helping more learners navigate pathways to uh, career um, success and also continued education. It is clearly, it's a national priority that is shared with educators, employers, and government. And most certainly it has been and continues to be a priority here in Massachusetts, borne out by the significant work um, begun with education reform, um, also with the development of frameworks, but also the support of our state government in funding um, significant projects and policies that um, have brought us along this road. 
you know, I've been proud through my professional career to watch history unfold with education reform as it evolved to include those clear frameworks that Chris spoke about. Um, the development of technical workplace skills competencies for students. Every single framework that's been developed in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts also includes um, a significant set of skills in workplace and personal skills development that students are required to achieve. And that's done through purposeful curriculum. And you will not find that model anywhere else. So from a student perspective, we're looking at their development as a whole student. It's become a collective vision, shall we say, um, supporting the idea of putting every learner's success first. It has become a shared vision for the future of CTE and a clear call to action for all of career and technical education. The frameworks ask leaders and policymakers, practitioners to come together with high quality CTE system where learners are prepared for success that they, um, they want to achieve and they want to succeed. Um, in Massachusetts, the CTE community is unique in its ability to work together, to share ideas, to share resources and celebrate successes. Um, you know, there is that old adage that you are what you celebrate and routinely what we celebrate in, in career and technical education are things like uh, CNA pinning ceremonies, LPN uh, pinning ceremonies, um, the achievement of um, um, safety credentials and the achievement of stackable credentials for students. Those are the types of things that are routinely celebrated in career and technical education. We celebrate students winning national, state, district skill competitions, uh, just like in Olympic games, but their, their competition is things like plumbing and electrical. We celebrate that and we celebrate their achievement of um, career essentials and personal skills development. So thinking about what you are, what you celebrate, we celebrate the, the development of the whole student. Um, we have really changed and innovated the CTE landscape to include all of this um, and to think strategically how we can expand our contributions to all education in Massachusetts and then moving forward. You know, it is a model for all education that um, that we um, educate the entire student. Um, this vision has resulted in, uh, you know, key guiding principles that directly impact students, including high standards, empowering learners, flexible learning opportunities for students. And it's all led by knowledgeable experts, because in a career and technical setting, all of the teachers are skilled trades people. And all of those people have significant backgrounds in the fields that they teach. And the goal is to put students first. Um, one thing that CTE leaders in Massachusetts do exceedingly well is that they collaborate and they build off one another's successes. Uh, MAVA and other school leaders are leading the charge and SkillsUSA has been proud uh, to support these efforts. Um, this vision is truly shared across the country and, and it's shared by other organizations like the, the, uh, that are um, uh, on the same line as SkillsUSA, other student organizations, uh, FFA and DECA and uh, Project Lead the Way and FIRST Robotics. These are all areas where student achievement is um, celebrated and students are challenged to achieve at the highest level. Um, as it has been for the last 49 years, um, SkillsUSA in Massachusetts is made up of school chapters um, that support visionary state leadership about best practices in education. Um, these schools promote academic and technical excellence and they ensure that the students are workforce ready. Uh, schools embrace the concept that every student should feel significant, valued, and included. And they support the implementation of SkillsUSA framework 
of personal workplace and technical skills development. This in turn helps our students develop in the 17 essential elements that will enable them to flourish in a global economy. And they do this through a commitment to purposeful education that complements their career in technical education. Uh, SkillsUSA considers itself a vital solution to the continuing skills gap, which has been complicated by the great resignation. But you will notice that the great resignation includes in far fewer numbers skilled trades professionals. Um, skilled trades people go to work every day. And through the pandemic, our schools were up and running first because the concept was that, listen, these people are going to work every day. So get those students in school and we're gonna be safe about how we do this, but we're gonna continue to educate them so that they are able to flourish in a global economy. Um, we serve more than 39,000 students as members of Skills USA and other student organizations. We cover all of the trade areas in our career and technical education high schools. Um, we serve these students in middle schools, in high schools and in college. Uh, we support the diverse talent pipeline of 130 different technical service and skilled occupations and the majority of STEM related areas as well. Uh, we're proud to work with the CTE community. Um, our work has been supporting the mission of CTE in Massachusetts and create those innovative ways where students learn best by engaging in what's important to them. Um, CTE in Massachusetts, of course, gains attention uh, for one reason, and the reason is that it works. Uh, it's truly the place where you can say it is an absolute fact that CTE concentrators are more likely to graduate high school uh, on time and they enroll in post-secondary education and be employed um, and earn those higher wages. And Skills USA achievement helps those students gain those achievements faster um, through uh, the, at the state level, the national level, and on into the international level. Massachusetts is at the top of its game by every metric available when you look at the, um, at the student achievement level. Things like competition, skill competition, leadership competition, in Massachusetts, we are continually in the top five of medal winning states at nationals every single year. Um, chapters are on, honored as models of excellence. This year in 2022 alone, four of the top 24 schools in the United States are from Massachusetts. Um, when it comes to service orientation, uh, the President's Volunteer Service Awards Massachusetts is at the top of its game as one of the highest achieving of the President's Volunteer Service Awards because our students are out in their communities using their skills to benefit their communities. Uh, service is an is a integral part of every single career and technical school where students can use their skills uh, to benefit their communities, but then in turn have that feeling of satisfaction of having done something and learning how to give back to others. Um, also career essentials credentialing, an actual credential that says that they are employable. We celebrate with that with them as well. Um, and then on the world stage, um, the World Skills Competition happens every other year, and Massachusetts is supplying contestants to World Skills uh, on a regular basis with specific emphasis in areas like welding, uh, plumbing, culinary arts, automotive refinishing, carpentry. These are all frequent areas of success for Massachusetts, but also our students are continually asked to serve as student leaders and ambassadors for career and technical education um, and across the world. And talk about wowing the world when you can bring a 17 year old uh, to an international event where they're able to do things like, um, you know, introduce the ambassador or meet, um, you know, a member of the royal family um, and do that with eloquence and grace. Um, our goal is to support all learners in their journeys, and it requires nothing short of an unending transformation. 
the hard work that's begun in Massachusetts and the leadership that is changing the face of career and technical education, we're doing that one student at a time. And we look forward to embracing and promoting this vision of putting student learners first and enable more of our student learners to live successful, productive lives and grow in their careers that are supporting their communities and our nation's economic prosperity. So, um, you know, I'm honored to be part of this and um, it's my honor to invite Barry to now join the conversation um, as we move forward with our presentation. So thanks, Barry. Thank you very much, uh, Karen. Um, this is a real joy to join uh, with my colleagues here to discuss uh, uh, technical education. Um, some of you know me, I, I actually spent 50 years teaching at universities at Boston College, at uh, UMass Boston and at Northeastern. Um, so I'm coming from a different world, but I didn't start there. I grew up in the city of Detroit. Uh, now, many of you may say, oh, that's too bad. But of course I was growing up in Detroit in the late 40s, 50s and 60s when Detroit was the richest city in the world. And I had the great opportunity of going to a great public high school in Detroit, Mumford High School, made famous later, later by Eddie Murphy in Beverly Hills Cop, uh, because I not only took college prep courses with the great, I, great expectation I'd gone to college, but I took a whole battery of CTE courses. I had a course in wood shop, I had a course in metal shop, I had two years of drafting, uh, I had a year of print shop, a semester of print shop, I printed my own business cards. And uh, that no doubt helped me through college because I had to pay my way through college, even though it was a public university and the tuition was low. I was able to, during the summers, go to work at a Ford factory. Uh, Ford has a big factory outside of Ann Arbor, Michigan in Rawsonville, which back in the 1960s was producing all kinds of parts for Ford automobiles. And so in the spring of, in the late spring, early summer of 1964, I was eligible to go to work on the assembly line at Ford because of the skills I'd learned at Mumford. And I ended up helping to build one of the most important products in the history of the world. I'll even show you it. It is a carburetor for the Ford Mustang in 1964 and a half. It's probably one of the best jobs I ever had, building something that's real. I have though, for the last uh, 50 years, uh, been an economist that studies labor markets. And when we look at, as Karen suggested, all the important ways that our vocational technical schools have helped our students uh, gain great occupations and great salaries, I tend to look at it also from the point of view of the business community, and most importantly, from the point of view of the entire economy of Massachusetts and of the country. And one of the things that we know, you can see it in me, uh, we have an aging population, a baby boom generation, which is moving on, retiring. And as a result, we have a tremendous need to replace workers who are retiring from jobs across the board, including plumbers, electricians, carpenters, you name it. And that's where the vocational education system has become so critical, not only for the students, but keeping the Massachusetts economy and the US economy afloat. I'll give you some numbers that I developed as part of uh, this presentation. One is that we know that not only has the population is the population retiring in places like Massachusetts, but because of the high cost of living in states like Massachusetts, California, New York, uh, increasingly other places, it's very difficult for people to in-migrate into those areas. So if we don't train our own workforce, we're gonna run out of labor. And how fast is that happening? Well, here are some of the data uh, in terms of looking at a forecast for the next 10 years, this happens to be for Massachusetts. It turns out the average annual change in the number of jobs in many of these occupations is quite small. We only need uh, about 15 more machinists each year. We only need about 70 more auto service techs, et cetera. But the problem is those are net new jobs. What about the retirees? Well, among machinists, uh, we only need about 15, there are only new, 15 new jobs, but we need over 1,100 people trained 
to not only fill those 15, but the nearly more than 1,100 who retire. In automotive service technicians, we need, there'll be 70 more jobs per year, but we need to find nearly 1,800 new workers to work as automotive service te techs. Tractor trailer drivers. Uh, we now have supply constraints all over the country, which are leading to massive inflation uh, and possibly with the rising interest rates, stagflation, rising inflation and unemployment, the worst of all economic worlds. And the real problem is we don't have enough truck drivers. I was recently in Savannah, Georgia, which is the third busiest port on the East Coast. And there were literally tens of thousands of containers sitting at that port in Savannah, waiting to be picked up by truck drivers. We don't have enough. First line production supervisors, maintenance and repair workers, nursing assistants, carpenters, licensed practical nurses, medical assistants. All of those are the kinds of jobs we need. And so the role that uh, vocational technical education is playing in the past was critical. The role it plays in the future, more critical than ever. It's also true that while we have superb vocational technical education throughout the Commonwealth, the city of Boston is lagged behind. Uh, we have one vocational technical school, that's Madison Park Vocational Tech High School in Dorchester. It is a school which unfortunately in the past has been, some people even say a dumping ground where students who, are, who have special needs or can't make it elsewhere are, are sent there. And as a result, it has had very low graduation rates relative to other schools, high dropout rates and so forth. Three years ago, a group of business leaders, civic leaders and some labor leaders came together. I'm working with them to form the Career Champions Network. And the role of the CCN is to work very closely with the administration of Madison Park and with the Boston Public School uh, Central Office and with Mayor Wu, our mayor in Boston and the city council to really raise up Madison Park to be an equal to the other great vocational schools. Uh, we have uh, a foundation and using, using those funds we've created, for example, the Cardinal of the Month uh, which rewards uh, the best freshman, sophomore, junior and senior every month in terms of being selected by faculty for their outstanding achievements. In fact, next week, we're going to have a luncheon uh, with the 32 uh, winners of that award. And we have members of the city council coming, we have members of the Boston uh, School Committee coming to celebrate uh, these students and to send a message that Madison Park is on its way. So what we need to do is continue to work closely with the business community, work closely with trade unions, work closely with civic leaders to make sure that all of our technical vocational high schools uh, are turning out the most accomplished students, not just to make sure that those students and their families have a great future before them, but to make sure that we have the labor force we need to maintain Massachusetts a uh, fine economic legacy. Unless we pay more attention to that, uh, the future of the economy is somewhat in risk. Well, thank you. I would like now to uh, ask Tim Murray uh, to unmute and join us uh, and add to our conversation. Again, thanks to the Pioneer Institute for allowing me to join you today. Well, Barry, thank you for uh... The, uh, your remarks, and I want to thank the Pioneer Institute for giving me the opportunity to uh, join this uh, important conversation about the future of vocational you know, technical education and uh, what we've been doing uh, here in Massachusetts. Uh, and uh, in Worcester, I think you know, we've got a pretty unique story, pretty unique story, uh, 100 plus years ago, the Worcester Vocational High School was established. Uh, and at the time it was called Enlightened Self-Interest. The Worcester industrialists at the time recognized uh, that they were gonna need skilled trained workers. Uh, and uh, with that, they wanted to also provide meaningful career opportunities that the growing industrial manufacturing sector in Central Mass was, was creating. And Worcester Boys Trade, as it was called, uh, you know, did exactly that. And years later, a, a girls trade was established. Uh, and it, it, 
it provided that workforce that was so critical. But like a lot of gateway cities or urban centers uh, or even you know regions that relied heavily on manufacturing, as that uh, ended, uh, that uh, sector in terms of its impact in many communities being the dominant sector. Um, you know, some of the, the the focus around our vocational technical schools waned, and uh, in some cases they were, were you know not looked at as being equal to maybe the traditional comprehensive high schools. And, um, you know, we're forgotten in the, in the conversation around uh, high school educations and high school education, what it means and what opportunities it can provide. You know, thankfully in Worcester, uh, that uh, was not necessarily the case. And I was elected to the city council. And one of the major votes that we took early on was to merge the vocational technical school into the Worcester public schools so that we could maximize a reimbursement. Uh, to build a new state-of-the-art vocational technical school that still had its manufacturing component, but also branched out uh, into the new emerging sectors that were driving Worcester and central Massachusetts economy, uh, life sciences and biotech, uh, the vet veterinary school uh, close by, uh, Tufts Veterinary Coming School of uh, Veterinary Medicine, uh, IT, financial services. So, uh, City working together with the state built uh, 10 plus years ago, a new state of the art vocational technical school uh, with endowments to keep the uh, with private sector commitment uh, significant, pretty significant to make sure that there was funds available each and every year to match dollars from the state or the, or the, or the, or the, or the city and the school department to make sure the students and faculty uh, had access to current equipment that was being used out in the private uh, private sector. That uh, investment and the change in, in our economy that has been taking place has been a huge success for Worcester Technical High School. Uh, it has, uh, we have waiting lists uh, across, you know, every year, which is uh, a, a challenge. We wanna make sure that every student and family that has access to chapter 74 vocational technical programs should have it. But in some cases, we also, uh, you know, have seen it as a model, which we are people from across Massachusetts and across the country are coming to Worcester Technical High School to see how a first class facility with high expectations for our, our young people, both in, in the classroom academically, as well as in their chapter 74 area program, uh, working in close coordination with the private sector is the new model, you know, going forward. Uh, and it's been recognized by people contemplating new, new, uh, creating these schools, uh, new construction. Uh, so we've seen, you know, that, that take off and uh, the academic results, you know, just as importantly, our students achieving, uh, going on to college, going on to careers, uh, contributing in a variety of different ways. We've had uh, President Obama uh, in the last couple of years of his administration, come and give the high school graduation at Worcester Technical High School. Colin Powell, um, a whole host of individuals come to the school, speak to the students, and talk about how work-based learning and education is, is really critical. Uh, that story uh, in Worcester uh, is, is also one that we, we're seeing increasingly across Massachusetts with students and families voting with their feet to attend vocational technical schools where they get a, a, a very rigorous academic education, but are also taught and that academic uh, curriculum is intertwined with a, a focus in, in one of the chapter 74 program fields that gives, that, 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 that gives them that extra ability to go out and earn, whether they go on to college or not, they learn what the workplace expects of them. Uh, and that, that model is what you know, across the state, we're seeing people go to. And with that, unfortunately, a waiting list of over 3,000 plus. That has created, um, uh, I, I think, some good, hard conversations in, in Massachusetts about our comp at our comprehensive high schools. What are they doing to engage students and families in a proven way? What are they doing to meet the economic needs of the regional economy in which that vocational technical school or in that case, the chapter 74 programs are located. Um, so, you know, that, those are good conversations to have. And candidly, 
as, as the president CEO of the Worcester Regional Chamber of Commerce with 2,300 members, you know, many of them small businesses, the single biggest issue that we hear from our members on a daily basis is wanting a uh, skilled and needing a skilled workforce. In many instances, uh, having you know, both the, 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 the academic and technical expertise that they get from a Chapter 74 program, but just in a most very basic level, understanding what the workplace expects of them. And our vocational technical schools do that in, in their, at their essence. Uh, it's theory and practice uh, every day. And so, you know, we, we've, we view it as an economic imperative as well. Uh, we have six vocational technical schools in our region, uh, our chamber service region, and we work closely with them uh, in linking up those students who are doing co-ops, usually the junior and senior year. They'll go out for a week at a time uh, and work, on a, work in a particular uh, facility. If they're in allied health, they will be at a hospital or perhaps a nursing home a type of setting. Uh, if they are in a construction a sector or a program, they'll be out on the construction site. If they're in a manufacturing program, if they are in a financial services program, the vet tech, uh, and, and we can go on for all uh, 23 programs that exist at Worcester uh, Regional, Worcester, Worcester Vocational Technical High School in some of our regions. And so they are ahead of the curve, not only in understanding what the workplace expects of, the, of them, but also having a technical expertise that empowers them as they go on to college or empowers them as they go on to the military, that empowers them as they go off to, to maybe start their own business or to the workforce, knowing uh, what is needed. Um, you know, policies that, that we would like to see, you know, in Massachusetts is how do we continue to expand Chapter 74 program? If our comp some of our comprehensive high schools that Barry alluded to in his remarks uh, are not succeeding, um, you know, how do we bring in Chapter 74 programs that clearly engage kids uh, in a hands-on way, but also uh, without taking a backseat on academic expectation and rigor? Uh, that's what our, our vocational technical schools do. And as we talk about a shortage across the country around, you know, workforce, uh, how do we make sure that uh, we are addressing that need? And, um, you know, we, we, we see this as, as critical going forward. Uh, we know in Washington, a lot of the conversation takes place about what are the needs of higher ed in traditional K through 12 education. But if we're serious, both as, uh, you know, on both sides of the political aisle about meeting the needs of, of, of the employer community, about giving economic empowerment to individuals and, and families, uh, vocational technical has to have increasingly uh, needs to be increasingly part of the conversation needs to get you know, the resources needed to do what they do, given some of the unique needs and equipment. Um, and the other element, you know, uh, of all of this, as I mentioned, equipment is, you know, uh, the students who are in these programs as high school also are working about safe, uh, uh, safe environments, um, in terms of, of, of where they work uh, and, and understanding uh, whether on a job site, what is needed there, there as well. So, you know, we, we really, um, we, we, we are really bullish on, on, on what's happened in Massachusetts uh, here locally, you know, uh, at, at the chamber uh, with about the future with our Vogue Tech schools. We're working aggressively with some of our comprehensive high schools here in the city of Worcester to add chapter 74 programs. So, um, you know, we're, we're, we're happy that this conversation is taking place. I want to thank the Pioneer Institute, you know, for, for this book and for helping facilitate this conversation uh, with, with the, the, the hands-on achievement uh, book and look forward to any questions. I, I believe there's some time uh, as I conclude for some questions and, and comments. Great, thank you so much, Tim. Really uh, appreciate you being able to join us in your remarks as well as your leadership uh, uh, at the chamber and when you were in, in office. Uh, so <clears throat> we have some follow-up questions. Um, I'm gonna try to move through them quickly. So I encourage the panelists to uh, you know, be, be brief. So I'll start with Dave Ferreira. You led MAVA, the Voc Tech Administrators Association in Massachusetts. If you were advising Voc Tech leaders in other states, what two things would you tell them to do to emulate Massachusetts? Uh, 
Uh, thank you, Jamie. I'm going to steal a minute because I it deserves recognition here of this distinguished group. Uh, and uh, Dr. Bluestone, um, you were part of our inspiration with that data you collected a number of years ago with the uh, AVTE. And Tim Murray, former Lieutenant Governor, if you want change in the model that you're using to provide vocational technical ag agricultural education, you need a champion. And our champion was Tim Murray. He is the only politician that I've never known, ever known, that actually visited during his term every single vocational technical school in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So I tip my hat to those gentlemen. Uh, and uh, so my advice is you need a champion. That champion can be from business and industry. That champion can be from the political sector and all politics is local. You know what kind of champion you need because doing it without someone in power, giving you that leadership, you have to have a leader. Thank you. Great. Chris, uh, this book has an introduction uh, about the turn of the century debate between uh, Black educators Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois on voc tech and the liberal arts for racial uplift. Uh, what are some of the lessons for us today from that uh, famous debate? Yeah, well, um, as neither gentleman is here, I'll have to plug their books for them. But uh, Up From Slavery by Booker T. Washington and the Souls of Black Folk by Du Bois, both extraordinary figures in American history and education, wonderful prose stylists and well worth a read. And their debate was essentially between Washington's view that uh, you know he started Tuskegee Institute from nothing. This is a guy who came from absolute poverty and uh, was the most influential black leader of his time. And then uh, Du Bois, who was from Western Massachusetts and uh, born free and, and had many more advantages, but viewed things from a different point of view and said, you really need to inspire kids. You need liberal arts um, in addition to you know, working manually. So their debate was, well, it was really two sides of the same coin because I think the key lesson there is that we need both. We need the practicality and we need the inspiration. And there's a, um, a story told well in the int introduction that Jackie Moore um, put together about uh, Washington being in the field and seeing a sharecropper boy who was reading a French grammar. And he thought, you know, that's not the way to go. You need, you need to have practical skills. And Du Bois looked at that and said, you know, that's actually inspiring. That child may never go to France. He may never to learn French, he may never need that, but he's aspiring to something beyond himself and beyond his present circumstances. So I think the lesson, the takeaway is to have balance and to have both and to not stop dreaming because you need aspirations. Thank you. Karen, uh, you lead Massachusetts Skills USA. What are the voc tech policies and skills you think Massachusetts policymakers should be thinking about over the next five years? On you. Yeah, that's a great question. So one thing I think we really need to um, uh, recognize in Massachusetts is we're gonna have a new administration, right? So I think the first thing is providing um, clear transition policies to the new administration um, that will help us achieve um, equitable economic um, you know, continuation. So I think that's gonna be um, a real, um, you know, a priority if you will, but also, um, I think there needs to be an absolute um, focus on the idea of um, innovative CTE ecosystem for that prepares every student for a career of their choice. And in terms of policy, I think you know the tenants that we need to keep in mind are first of all, elevating the emphasis and importance of the role um, of state leadership in CTE. Um, there is a bill right now that contains um, language about the, um, you know, adding a deputy commissioner level position in the DESE for uh, career and technical education. I think that's a priority uh, that should be, you know, one of the tenants, but also ensuring that every learner um, is adequately supported, um, you know, in the, all of their dimensions of equity that we can think about. I think that's probably going to be uh, critical. And promoting policies that speak to a full 
learning continuum uh, from K-12 through a career. Um, you know, I think the whole idea of middle schools uh, is critical to the success of career and technical education to the success of careers. So I think that's really where we need to be in terms of policy. Great, thank you. And Barry, I wanna echo what David said about your really strong uh, uh, intellectual leadership on this topic. So you've worked on the VOC uh, topic for a while. What are the lessons that higher education institutions might be able to learn from the, these VOC tech schools? Thank you for that kind comment. Well, you know, one of the things that it did learn uh, is, in a, and it's rare among schools, is my last 20 years were at Northeastern University. When I first got to Northeastern University, it was in the middle, you know, it wasn't the great school it is today. But what Northeastern has more than any other school in the country, of course, is the co-op program. So that all of our students uh, spend part of their career at Northeastern working at a firm with, with pay, and therefore they get the hands-on experience in addition to what they get in the classroom that has made our students so very successful. And I think that's why Northeastern with its literally thousands and thousands of co-op employers all across the world has uh, helped Northeastern become one of the top schools in the country because we recognize that what the Vogue schools have done in terms of hands-on work in the workshops, the academic work, but also allowing our kids to go out on co-op uh, so they, they get those real world skills in a real world environment is something that many more universities and higher education institutions could learn about. Thanks. So uh, Tim, uh, Worcester is a real leader in the field of vocational technical uh, education. Could you talk about the relationships that were forged between the business community, organized labor and higher education in supporting voc techs in central mass? Well, you know, I, I mentioned in my opening remarks, you know, the whole genesis to, to build the school, you saw the business community step up and raise money to uh, leverage the state dollars that were, were coming to make sure the school was built uh, with all the extras that, that were needed to create the endowment. Clearly, uh, local, particularly in the construction building trades, uh, and some of the manufacturing unions, you know, saw the need and recognized the importance of, of a skilled workforce to meet, you know, their 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 uh, demands uh, as they work for their employers and contractors. So it was really groups that maybe not always in agreement coming together, recognizing how critical this was to their particular self-interest, but also to the overall well-being of the community from an economic development point of view and you know, empowering uh, economically individuals and families with real good jobs and skills that, uh, you know, really can build futures and in, in wealth for families. Thanks. David, uh, could you talk about some of the lessons from the Massachusetts agricultural voc tech schools? And, and, and in particular, what are the kind of the models or lessons for other states? What's interesting, Jamie, is uh, Massachusetts doesn't have all that many uh, because of our economic uh, strength in other areas, we don't have that many vocational, uh, sorry, agricultural schools. We have two county agricultural schools, Norfolk and Bristol. And then we have two vocational technical schools who are also agricultural schools, those being Smith in Northampton and Essex in Saugus. But the model is consistent. The model is around focusing on what your mission is and integrating, whether it's agricultural education or whether it's animal science is your concentration, you do the same thing. So what works for one can work for the other. So the things that we talked about, like autonomy and, and getting a champion is equally important. And FFA, is a comparable um, opportunity as is Skills USA for youngsters that are studying animal science as well as agricultural science. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, Chris, you've had a long career in journalism. What advice do you have for the Vogue Tech community about making their uh, case uh, about the successes to the press and to the wider public? Right, um, in a word, tell great stories. I mean, there is no lack of, of great stories coming out of Vogue Tech schools. 
And um, you just need to tell them. And the way to do that is to be persistent with the media, to provide um, diverse and articulate young people uh, you know, from across the spectrum who are going to be able to uh, make the case and demonstrate the excellence of what they've learned. Um, and to be um, also promote data, give them data. I mean, reporters are busy people. Sometimes they're lazy people, if the truth be known, and they'll take shortcuts and they'll put words in your mouth. So you want to give them as much material as they need, including quotations, access to people in the administration and hard data of the kind that, that Barry has referred to and provided to us um, so that they have no excuse but to tell a great story because they are out there. Thanks so much. Uh, so Karen, we're on the threshold of an era of uh, AI and robotics. Could you talk about some of the successes that the Vogue Tech Schools in Massachusetts have enjoyed in terms of uh, Skills USA and the area of robotics? Yeah, for sure. Uh, well, first of all, I think it, you know it's it's fair to say that you know there are more computers and uh, robots in your car than there were in the first Apollo mission. So you know the robotics is really across the board in every vocational technical school. Um, you know, there's a focus on, um, you know, things like urban search and rescue uh, mission. Uh, that is an actionable mission for um, our military, but also disaster relief. Um, and our students program those robots and, you know, they learn to, um, you know, to work with a variety of types of robotic um, implements. And it doesn't matter the trade because they're all you know, working with them. Um, the newest is uh, drone technology. Um, you know, that's being taught in our career and technical schools. Uh, we have students that have drone pilot licenses. Uh, it's also a new competitive event at this, the national and international level is drone technology. So, you know, when you look at robotics, these schools are just absolutely chock full of every type of robotic training and opportunity that's that is imaginable because that is what's the future and we teach to the future uh, not the past and curriculum changes um literally month by month in career and technical education because we have to keep up with technology so in terms of robotics um you know if you ask about student achievement in that um you know massachusetts um just absolutely um, achieves at the absolute highest level in all the robotic areas. So, um, you know, I hope that answers the question that um, you're looking for there. No, it's perfect. So Barry, you're a scholar on human capital and workforce development. What are the kinds of jobs Voc Tech schools need to be thinking about now in order to diversify our workforce? Well, I think there are a range of them, but one, I wanna thank Karen for her comments because I need her desperately. Uh, for my birthday last year, my son gave me a drone I've tried to master this. I haven't figured this out yet. And if you have a student who could help me fly this drone, I need to talk to you. I think when we look at the, ex the expanding economy, first of all, we can't forget, which we often do in Massachusetts, that the traditional skills are need workers. Uh, you need a carpenter. You need a plumber. You need an electrician. And we're desperate for those. So the traditional ones are important. But of course, expanding into IT, into information technology, we're also, particularly with an aging population, need an expanded healthcare delivery system, which means all the kinds of things we do with dental assisting, medical assisting, uh, and so forth are important. I think it's also, uh, as we move to, I'm a Detroiter, as we move toward a whole new form of vehicles in terms of electric cars, we're going to need an entire uh, you know, battalion of people who know how to repair electric cars, keep them on the road and keep them functioning. Robotics, of course, very important. And I will also add video tech. Um, video has become so important, including what we're doing right now, uh, that the more students who can, who can learn those skills and help us with it uh, will be important. The last, uh, and I think it's something that maybe some of the vocal schools are doing, I'm not sure, is that many of these students have an opportunity of running their own businesses mm -hmm. uh, and really moving up and then employing others. So it would seem to me that we should also be offering, you know, kind of business classes 
to students who want to go into a business in the occupation in which they work. So they know a little bit about accounting, they know a little bit about certificates and so forth, so that someday down the road, they know they're not only going to be, you know, a plumber, but they're going to have their own plumbing company and employ 20 other people doing that kind of work. Thanks so much. Uh, Tim is a, a former mayor who uh, uh, provided a lot of leadership on Voctex. What are the lessons for uh, you have for other mayors uh, uh, and how to lead on Voctex reform? Well, look, I mean, you know, from an educational point of view, you, you know, our vocational technical schools are punching way above their weight and leading the way. Uh, in addition, you know, from terms of the academic measures, uh, that we look at MCAS scores, you know, et cetera. Um, but in addition to that, they are providing these young people real world skills, which gives them a distinct advantage on day one when they enter the workforce, gives them an advantage when they go on to college uh, or, or do both. Um, so, uh, you know, if you're talking about as a mayor, your job is to advocate for the needs of your community, both in the current uh, you know, state, you know, current moment, but also hopefully thinking what's in the long-term best interest uh, of your, your community. Uh, so it makes total sense for them to be advocating for vocational technical education and, and the expansion of it. The other element of that is, look, especially our, our mayors in gateway cities, uh, um, you know, you're constantly trying to compete and bring in new investment, private sector development. Part of that conversation is about having the workforce you know, that they're going to need to, to do the work uh, in all of the fields that we've talked about uh, here today. So nobody does that better than our vocational mm -hmm. technical school. When we think of educational achievement and empowering your constituents, uh, voters and, and their kids, vocational technical schools are there. If you can point to a company, whether they're in, 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 in the city looking to grow and expand or looking to come in to say, look, we've got a pipeline every year of graduates who are trained uh, in particular areas or at the very least know what the workplace expects of them on day one, our voc tech schools do that, our chapter 74 programs do that. Great. Well, uh, we wanna be respectful of everyone's time, but I wanna tell everyone how grateful I am for their participation today, all their terrific work. I wanna give a, a particular thanks to Chris and David, who I, and I think did a superb job on this book. Uh, here it is, Hands-On Achievement. It's available uh, on Amazon. <clears throat> and uh, this is a topic that I think we uh, know is going to continue to have a lot of resonance as people are uh, engaged with uh, uh, hopefully the, the post-COVID world. Uh, but uh, of course, give kids the knowledge and skills that they need to survive and compete in our global economy. So with that, thank you all for your participation and work. Thank you. Thank you.